Professor Bob Carter is the adjunct professor of geology at James Cook University, and he's been good enough to come on the program this evening. Hello, Professor. Thanks for your time. Good evening, Michael, and good evening to your listeners. Can I just kick this off by saying, as I did at the beginning of my program this evening, that I was always a little suspicious about global warming, not from a scientific point of view, but I have been doing this for a while, and I think I know hype when I see it. And it is my view, rightly or wrongly, that if something has merit, it will withstand debate. But from the very beginning, there seemed to be this active suppression of any contrary views, which made me suspicious all along the way. Then we went through the phase of, uh, you know, the argument's been settled, the science is settled, uh, no further correspondence will be entered into. But it seems to me in the recent past, there are so many things now that point to this being the scam of the century that surely it has to turn. But here we are in Australia stuck with this carbon tax. But tell me your reaction. Well, the carbon tax is this in a sense, a separate issue. Let's get on to that next. But uh, first, may I say that your nose is exactly right. And the mystery, to somebody like me, is why so many, like well over 90% of the experienced journalists in this world, be they newspaper or radio or television journalists, have been taken in by all this stuff and have not, like you, sniffed the air and done some independent investigation because it was your phrase, not mine, but if you want to summarise what's been going on in a phrase, it is indeed true that dangerous global warming, and I stress the word dangerous, dangerous global warming caused by human carbon dioxide emissions is a scam. Yes, it is. So where have the media been? So look at some of these stories that are around today. Now, Germany, I guess because of the Greens' influence over there, but historically for quite some time now, has always put a lot of money into green generating programs but there's a great deal of controversy i understand as a result of a book that's uh, out there now saying something to the effect of the sun is cold so really it's the effect of the sun and it's not really the introduction of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that's making the difference uh depending on which one you choose i believe it can be pointed out there has been no significant global warming for the last decade the last 12 years or the last 15 years. Is that your understanding? That's absolutely true. But backing up to your German comments, uh, the gentleman's name is Professor Fritz Warenholt, and he's a senior social democratic politician and one of the founders of the Green Party, which, as you know, is very, very strong in Germany. And Professor Warenholt, bless his heart, has had an epiphany. And about two years ago, he checked some of the IPCC reports. That's the Intergovernmental Panel of the United Nations from where this alarm largely stems. And he was horrified to find not a mistake or two, but hundreds of mistakes in areas that he knew about. And so from that, like many of us, I had my epiphany back in 2000, 2001, when the same thing happened to me. Mm -hmm. And Professor Fritz Fahrenholt is, you might say, a Johnny-come-lately. The difference is he is a distinguished senior politician and green of the European tradition. So when he writes a book, which he's written, as you've rightly said, called The Cold Sun, uh, in advance of publication, it's not out yet, it's going to be out in a week or so, it's already number one on the Amazon bestseller list for environmental books in Europe, and it will sell in the tens of thousands of copies. And uh, I think it's true that when you have a religion, and that's what this global warming church is, Mm. uh, it actually requires people within the religion to change their mind and to start proselytizing their change of mind. Oh, so you you think this this is what we might be seeing here? This is uh, St. Paul on the way to Damascus for this man? We are undoubtedly seeing this. There are many other people who have written books like uh, Professor Varenholtz and written papers and gone on television and all the rest of it for the last 10 years saying the same sorts of things that he's saying. And yes, many of those scientists have been saying that the sun plays a much larger part in controlling the fluctuations in climate we're seeing at the moment than does human caused carbon dioxide. So in that sense, there's nothing new about his message. But what's really powerful is because of who he is, that message is finally going to be listened to. Now, the major daily newspaper in Australia is called The Bill. It has 16 million subscribers. In Germany. In Germany. And it has just 
run the first of a series of um, articles it's going to do on this, four pages, commenting on Professor Varenhold's book, uh, and the headline is The Carbon Dioxide Lies. So you talk about epiphanies. I, I think it's interesting, and th- this goes to my ultimate point, I suppose. Not that the information you and I are discussing is new, but there seems to be something of a groundswell. There's a fellow that I read. His name is Roger Ebert. He's a film reviewer. Now, Ebert was driving to Palm Springs, and I first took that drive he's describing about 30 years ago, and I noticed the wind turbines there. And it occurred to me when wind turbines became promoted as, uh, you know, the answer to clean green power, that they'd been there for a long time. And further, just in commercial terms, any venture capitalist worth his salt who was to say, wow, you can get this wind free and all we have to do is put in some infrastructure, let's leap on it. But they haven't done it. They only do it if it's subsidized. But to my ultimate point, Ebert had his epiphany. He always thought wind farms and windmills, wind turbines, whatever, look kind of nice. But he was very surprised to learn from seeing this documentary called Windfall that, in fact, they're great big things. Now, I've noticed in the advertising for energy companies, the windmills themselves are always only about half the size of the nice-looking man in the white coat and the hard hat, when, in fact, they're enormous. And then he goes into some detail about the impact on wildlife. I mentioned about the little bats and their lungs exploding and the birds being chopped up and so on. And also, I, I suppose broader points about whether or not they're worthwhile in terms of do they generate more, do they consume more energy than they generate. But here's my, here's my ultimate point, Professor. There seems to be a movement now with this particular program, Windfall, with all these stories we're talking about, with the reports of the, the freezing winters, the Venice canals freezing over, there seems to be a movement that surely belies what we've been told as the orthodoxy up to now. Absolutely right. And let me make two main points in response to that. Um, The first one is that because of that misinformation, we in Australia are stuck with this ludicrous carbon dioxide tax. And I'd like to come back to that in a moment. But regarding the windmills themselves, there's a wonderful phrase for describing windmills and solar farms, which together form what you might call eco-bling. (laughs) They are feel-good things, which are, in engineering terms, when you talk cost efficiency, completely useless. They are utterly uncompetitive, and they require enormous amounts of taxpayers' money uh, to to encourage a power company to actually run them. Now, that's not to say they don't have some very clever engineering and science in them, and that to a, um, a mechanical freak, they are beautiful engines in their own right. But if you're talking of running a national power system... They are eco-bling. Now, Germany is the classic example. I think I'm right in saying they have, with respect to the amount of power they need, the greatest installed wind power base in the world. It's actually 27 gigawatts, which is of the order of 15 to 20 uh, major commercial coal-fired or gas power stations. So they've got 27 gigawatts of of generating capacity in their windmills during the peak of the cold snap last week because when you have cold snaps in the northern hemisphere they tend to go with no wind conditions right. those 27 gigawatts of windmills were producing less than one gigawatt of power hmm. so what did they do then so buy it from france over the border who's generating it using nuclear why didn't the German power system collapse? Precisely. It didn't collapse because building those 27 gigawatts of new windmills has not resulted in the closure of a single conventional power station. Ah, of course, yeah. never will because you have to have what is called spinning reserve. You have to have power stations sitting there ready to provide the load when wind unexpectedly and completely unpredictably drops out, as it does the whole time. The net effect of this on a power grid is to impose huge inefficiency on the power grid, and Germany's is in many ways at the close of collapse at the moment, not least because of the government's other political knee-jerk reaction to the Japanese nuclear disaster, which was to suddenly close all the nuclear power stations in Germany. So Germany is actually skating on incredibly thin ice at the moment in terms of being able to provide the power that it needs during one of the coldest cold snaps that we've had uh, this century. Now, you said you want to make a comment about the carbon tax in this country? 
Yeah, it's hard to make a polite comment, isn't it? Because so many people pointed out um, so long in advance that this was not the thing to do. I think all you can say about this is the worst legislation that has ever passed the federal parliament in Australia. Why do I say that? Because it is a deliberate attack on the cost of energy in Australia. And the Australian economy's greatest natural advantage over the last 50 years has been cheap energy from coal-fired power stations. Now, when you attack that and deliberately increase the cost of energy in all sorts of ways, it's not just the carbon dioxide tax, it's the thing, the one or two billion dollars is the figure that we're already spending every year subsidising eco-bling like windmills and solar farms. Mm. So there's huge costs all over the place. Um, and uh, what do you get back in return? You get back in return a small decrease, perhaps, in the output of carbon dioxide. Now, if Australia was to close its economy completely, no carbon dioxide emissions from Australia at all, the theoretical effect on global temperature would be to the second decimal place, that is, to the one-hundredth of a degree. And when we talk of the amount of savings that will be made by cutting our emissions by 20% or whatever, you move to the third and fourth decimal degrees. But the cost of the carbon dioxide tax to the average Australian family of four people is going to be of the order of $2,000 per family per year. And in return for that, you get a notional reduction in global temperature of one thousandth to one ten thousandth of a degree. That is totally absurd. Indeed, it is insane policy if you accept the word insane means out of the rational mind. Yes, it's not particularly rational. Some of the uh, stories that are around, uh, of course, we all know about the Queensland floods. I mean, that's sort of taking us in another direction, the comments that were made by Professor Flannery about how it wouldn't rain again, even if it did, the earth would be too dry to absorb the water, all that sort of thing. The uh, On the politics of it, the fight on today in the federal parliament where the prime minister refuses to address the issue of the carbon tax. This has happened for the last two days. But I think it's worth noting, this is the most recent AAP story I have here. Victoria largely blames the federal government's carbon tax for 600 jobs being on the line at the Alcoa Geelong aluminium smelter. The state opposition and the union. So it's not just bad old Tony Abbott. It's the state opposition in Victoria, apparently, because they're Labor, and the union warned it would devastate the region if the jobs disappear. Well, they did, and one of the astonishing things to me is the union movement has gone along, and as you know, Greg Combe is a former union leader, and it's just astonishing the degree to which the union leadership in Australia has let their members down. Uh, they've gone along with this federal government nonsense, and it is nonsense, in the full knowledge it is going to cost thousands, if not tens of thousands of jobs. Um, it, words almost fail me as a scientist. Remember, I'm used to looking at equations and thinking of um, predictable outcomes. Mm. And the economists, you're quite right, and, and many politicians predicted absolutely rightly that the effect of a carbon dioxide, it's not a carbon tax, by the way. One of the really alarming things is that the opposition allows the government to go on calling this a carbon tax. It's got nothing to do with carbon. We don't discuss Sydney's water supply in terms of hydrogen. No, that's true. In terms of water, H2O, hydrogen yeah, dioxide. As we learned in physics the class. The here is carbon dioxide, yeah. a colourless, tasteless, odourless, invisible gas, which is an environmental benefit. Without carbon dioxide, we don't have plants, and without plants, we have no food chain. So when you use the word scam earlier, it is true that the global warming issue in the broad sense is a scam, but it's even truer that it's an unbelievable scam that the public, and indeed all our school children today, have been indoctrinated with the view that carbon dioxide is an environmental danger and a negative. That's total nonsense. Increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere results in greater plant growth. And it may not have escaped your attention that some very distinguished physicists, especially from Russia, are now projecting that in the next 20 years we're going to go into a little ice age. That's right. Yeah, and I've seen that. that. The great grain-growing areas of the world are the northern hemisphere mid to high latitudes in Russia and then across Canada uh, and the U.S. 
and a half a degree drop in temperature there results in something like a 10 or 15 percent in grain production. So if we're going to have a problem with the global climate in the next 20, 30 years, it's going to be cooling, not warming. And this is not something to joke about. Uh, we will have a problem feeding the people in the world unless we sort out how we're going to do it. And I'm sure we will find ways of doing it. The point is, at the very moment that cooling is the greatest danger, we have governments who are totally out of touch with reality still fantasizing about imaginary human-caused global warming. I, d I don't think the Western political system has ever been in a situation like it's in at the moment since the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment taught us to use sound science and good engineering principles and practice. We've built our whole societies on that, up into industrialized societies, up until about the 1970s and 1980s. But since then, we've moved into a phase of adopting what is called postmodern science. Oh, yes. And postmodern science is basically, as anything to do with postmodernism, that there's no objective reality, it's all opinions. And your opinion's as good as mine. And I'm a green, and my opinion is carbon dioxide is an environmental poison, and I've got the votes, so we're going to pass a carbon dioxide bill. And that is actually what has happened. I do appreciate your comments tonight. Let's finish on this note. We've already agreed. I think it's risky to be predicting uh, when you look at some academics that we haven't heard from in the recent past. But do you think we are now getting to the stage where there's so much information, there's so much contradiction of, you know, the science is settled, the orthodoxy, it really is building to the point where it can't be ignored? Yes, I think you identified that yourself earlier, yeah. and we discussed the German example, um, almost worldwide, but certainly in countries like Australia, uh, public opinion has swung in the last three years from being 80% in favour of the view global warming is a crisis to 20% against. It's now the other way around. Yeah. You now have 80% of the public who have seen through this. And I should say thank you to you and other 2UE announcers because of all the radio stations in Australia, there's no question whatsoever 2UE has done the best and the most to try and keep it, its listeners informed of the, shall we say, more balanced scientific viewpoints that are out there. Professor, I do appreciate your time. Thank you very much for coming on the program this evening. You're very welcome, Michael. Good night. Professor Bob Carter, adjunct research professor of geology at James Cook University.